Amen. Amen. Get born by your mom and then get born by God. Amen. All right, our first verse will be in 1 Samuel chapter 16. Uh, good to be here and enjoyed that, that preaching. Just uh, I don't know what goes on when that book is open and somebody yeah. preaches. And I, I guess it's authority of, of, of what we're reading, the authority behind the words. Man, it just really does something for you. Amen. Uh, just getting around it is uh, a real blessing. And I enjoyed that, uh, that preaching already. All right, let's pray together and we'll look at some things. Um, Lord God, bow before you now. Thank you, Lord, again for this opportunity and ask you, God, to let the words of God uh, find their way into the hearts of your people. And I pray, God, we do our best to get them, to understand them, Lord, to, to rely on them, to trust them, to live by them. God, I, I pray that all of us here would be affected by what's said and done here tonight. And I pray all of us would take another step closer to you, Lord, and maybe even some great decisions made. And we ask you to please have free will in our midst. I ask you, God, to deal with your people on a personal level. I pray you ask, I ask you to help me, Lord, and lend me a portion of thy spirit, I pray. Help me to preach for you, Lord. Please guard my thoughts and my mouth uh, from error and uh, let the truth get where it needs to go. And we pray it and ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 All right, 1 Samuel and chapter 16, and in our passage, uh, Saul is the king of Israel, and he's a big guy, uh, fleshly speaking, he's a good-sized man, he's somebody to look up to, and he is the king of Israel, and God has disapproved Saul. Saul has done some things, most of you know the story how he was a rebellious king and didn't want to follow God, didn't want to trust God. And in this point here where we're at, God has pretty much rejected him. And you're this king of Israel, but you're a bad king, and uh, I don't want you to be king, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to weed you out and bring somebody else in. And so God has chosen somebody else to be king, and we read here in verse number 1, 1 Samuel 16, 1, and the Lord... And the Lord said unto Samuel, How long wilt thou mourn for Saul, seeing I have rejected him from reigning over Israel? Fill thine horn with oil and go. I will send thee to Jesse the Bethlehemite, for I have provided me a king among his sons. So the next king, God has already arranged to have a king replace Saul. And... Um, uh, this king, of course, is David, and he's going to be tested to see uh, what kind of a man he is, and uh, go down there to verse 12, 1 Samuel 16 and verse 12. And he sent and brought him in, now he was ruddy, and with all of a beautiful countenance, and goodly to look to. And the Lord said, Arise, anoint him, for this is he. And then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brethren. And the Spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. So Samuel rose up and went to Ramah. So here God has anointed David to be king and is going to weed Saul out. And it is clear that God was going to establish David as the new king, and Saul was going to be on his way out. And uh, David was put in a position now to be the anointed king, but all of Israel has not seen that. They anointed him. There was a group of men there, and some of the hierarchy in the area knew that God had uh, anointed David, but all of Israel weren't there when this happened, and they needed to have confidence in this king. And, and I believe it was the slain of Goliath that brought all of Israel, to David as to recognize him as somebody that they could uh, get behind as their new king. Uh, take your Bible and go to 1 Samuel chapter 18. So I believe God just lets um, David go in and take out this giant. 
and uh, to help all Israel see that this is going to be your new king, and I need you to be behind him. And uh, verse 5, the Bible says, And David went out with us, whoever Saul sent him, and behaved himself wisely, and Saul set him over the men of war, and he was accepted in the sight of all the people. And there it is there, they saw it. And, and also in the sight of Saul's servants. And it came to pass as they came, when Saul was returned from the slaughter of the Philistine, that the women came out of the cities of Israel, singing and dancing to meet King Saul with tabrets and with joy and with instruments of music. And the women answered one another as they played and said, Saul has slain his thousands and David his ten thousands. So even everybody knew, everybody knew, boy, this guy is our new hero. He is the new guy on the block, and man, is he a, a great soldier, a valiant man, a godly man, uh, a faithful man. Well, boy, he just went after that giant that giant was way bigger than he was, and he's just this little ruddy guy. And look at his faith, and look at his uh, bravery, and boy, he, he really got to be of, of notoriety when that happened. So all Israel knew this young soldier named David, the son of Jesse, the Bethlehemite. Uh, but there was, another, there was another man that was impressed with David that day. And when David killed Goliath, Saul called for him, and... Uh, and Saul wanted to meet this young man that killed Goliath. And so uh, David comes to Saul uh, with that trophy. And he got that big old head, you know, in his hand. And, uh, and uh, we pick it up here in verse 17. Uh, for, I mean, I'm sorry, uh, 1 Samuel 17. 1 Samuel 17 and verse 53. And so, so far what we're looking at is uh, God realizes this this king over Israel is not worthy of my people, Israel. I'm going to get rid of him, and, and I'm going to bring in a guy that's after my heart. I'm going to bring in a guy that's a better man. But I need Israel to know my choosing. I want all the big guys, all the big shots to know that I've chosen them, and I want all the people of Israel also to know. And he, They're going to see that this, this is a great guy, somebody they can trust, somebody that loves God. And so this thing is done with Goliath, verse um, 1753. And the children of Israel returned from chasing after the Philistine and spoiled their tents. And David took the head of the Philistine and brought it to Jerusalem, but he put his armor in his tent. And when Saul saw David go forth against the Philistine, he said unto Abner, the captain of the host, Abner, whose son is this youth? And Abner said, As thy soul liveth, O king, I cannot tell. And the king said, Inquire thou whose son this stripling is. And as David returned from the slaughter of the Philistine, Abner took him and brought him before Saul and with the head of the Philistine in his hand. And Saul said to him, Whose son art thou, thou young man? And David answered, I am the son of thy servant Jesse, the Bethlehemite. So Abner goes out, tracks him down, finds him, and it wasn't too hard to find him. There were crowds of people around him. All he had to do was look for the crowd go in there, and uh, of course he had gone to his tent by then, and he goes and he gets him, and he says, a king wants to talk to you, and David says, hold it. <laughs> he goes over and he gets a wad of hair off that, that big old fat head, I can't imagine what it must have looked like, and dripping with blood, you know, and uh, got his sword on one side and his head on the other side, and he says, all right, let's go. <laughs> so, so Abner and uh, David go into this room where the king is. And uh, Jonathan's in there, the king's son. And there's other men in there as well. And this little fella comes walking in. It says he's ruddy and he's goodly to look on. And, uh, but we all saw how brave he was. And we all heard his words, how he trusted the living God. It gives me chills just yeah. thinking about it. You see, we see a man like that with the, that had this desire and this zeal to, to face this giant like this. And with his life on the line and with Israel as his as his goal uh, to f give them the liberty and the freedom from this Philistine army. And, and so he comes in, and uh, the Bible says here in, in chapter 18, if you look there in verse 1, that he comes into the tent there, and it says there in verse 1, And it came to pass, when he had made an end of speaking unto Saul, that the soul of Jonathan was knit with the soul of David, and Jonathan loved him as his own soul. Verse 2, and Saul took him that day and would 
and would let him go no more home to his father's house. And then Jonathan and David made a covenant because he loved him as his own soul. So Jonathan stood there and saw this young man with this big head in his hand, this small little stripling, as the Bible calls him, standing there holding that trophy. And I must say, uh, as we read this, Jonathan stands there and goes, that is one heck of a soldier right there. (laughs) That's the kind of guy, you know, I've seen a lot of men. I've trained a few. This guy here, this is one brave man. And the Bible said Jonathan's opinion of David just went through the roof. And he was very impressed. And I got to say, as I read the story, I'm very impressed. I'm very impressed with a man that can stand up like that for a right cause like that. Amen? Amen. And then go forward like that with life on the line and just perform the way he did. And Jonathan's there, and Jonathan is the son of Saul. And Saul's a bad king. And David is going to be the new king, and he's a good man. So Jonathan loves David, and here he makes a covenant with David. And they get together, and the covenant had to do with loyalty, and it had to do with, you know, Jonathan also was there probably, I'm guessing, when Samuel anointed him. I'm not sure if he was or not. Maybe he knew, maybe he didn't. But he gets the sneaking suspicion in his own heart that God's going to make him king. And he says so later on. Uh, But Jonathan's very impressed, and he loves his father, uh, and he's afraid of his father, and he respects the office of his father and his king. And uh, he's loyal, and he wants to be loyal to his father. But another man has stepped up, and he's a better man. And Jonathan in his heart knows that he's a better man. And so he's um, a little bit concerned because he's next in line to be king. He's a prince himself. All Israel will be his someday, but only if he follows with his father's footsteps. And now God is rejecting his father and bringing in David. And now David has proved to all Israel that he's the right man for the job. And when Jonathan stands there and looks at this thing, he's convinced as well. And so he's in, a, he's in a situation here. He's in a position between two great authorities. I'm right stuck in the middle here. And I'm in a bad spot. Because the father who I love and I fear and I respect is not a good man. He's a rebellious man. He's thrown a javelin at me. He gets angry really easy. He has a bad spirit in him. I see his attitude. Uh, when we deal about things of God, he's not sound. He's not, he's not a good man. And when I see David and I see his bravery and I see his goodness, I love that man. I like David. David is so cool. He's everything I I ever saw, just the perfect soldier, the perfect man. If there was ever going to be a king, that should be the guy, but that would be a traitorous thing against my father. So he is really stuck in the middle here, and it's kind of like you. You're kind of stuck in the middle, too. You live in this world, and it dictates what you should do, and it's not a good world. It's a mean world. It doesn't like David. It doesn't like Christ. It's always developing laws and always trying to push away from God and take prayers out of the schools. And on and on we could go. But we found another soldier. We found another man. We found Jesus Christ. And we noticed that. We, we see what he did and we watch what he does and we've seen how he treats us and we see him to be a good man. Amen. And we're convinced by all that he did, which is far greater than what David did, the way he went to that cross, the way he laid his life down, all the things he said and did, we marvel. We know who the right king is. It's not, a, it's not hard for us to see that. Just like Jonathan, it wasn't hard for Jonathan to see who the good man was, who the right man was. And this other authority in my life is not the right authority, and I am in a, I, I got to make a decision here. I got to see which way I'm going to go. And uh, so Jesus st- steps up in this uh, tent here, and Jonathan's impressed with him, and 
uh, Jonathan has to start figuring out in his mind how he's going to step away from the king and join ranks with David. And that's going to be tough to do. It's going to be tough to do. And he doesn't want to do it. He wants to play both sides as long as he can. Because he knows if he goes with David, his dad will probably try to kill him just like he's trying to kill David. So he's in a real situation. And plus, he's made a covenant with David. And that covenant had to do with being loyal, and I'll be on your side, and I'll be for you, and I'll make sure you're okay, and I'll use all the power I have to... And he does. I mean, he gets in between Saul and David many times, and he tries to tell Saul, what, what bad has he ever done? He's been a good man. He, he tries to convince him over and over again. And, of course, Saul's not having it because he's a devil, yeah. <laughs> straight out. He's just a, he's just a bad mind. A bad, uh, but Jonathan has to start pulling back, and that's what you got to do. you got to shun the world. The world's on a course, and it's not a good course. It's a bad course, and we want to live under a different authority, and we want to reject the one that's not the right one, and that's going to be tough to do because we live here, and we're under the laws of the government, and especially in California, man, we're, we're, (laughs) this is a bad state. I mean, we're under some stuff here, but notice, if you will, chapter 18 and verse 3, and then Jonathan and David made a covenant because he loved him as his own soul. Amen. He, he, he loved David. At least a good or better, uh, uh, you know, um, I'm losing my thoughts here. But he makes a promise. He makes a covenant with David. And uh, you, you found that uh, Jesus Christ loves you. And uh, you made a covenant. You got on your knees and you swore that you believed what he did and you and Jesus made a covenant together and he said, if you'll call on me and trust my gospel, I'll save you. Amen. You do your part, I'll do my part and you made that covenant. And so Jonathan makes this covenant and it's to David. He doesn't make the covenant with his father, he makes it with David and so he's got a loyalty thing going there. And Jonathan is in a, in a real situation He loves his father, but his father's no good. And he's seen the evil spirit come out of his father several times, and he knows his father well. Uh, Jonathan's turmoil is to uh, pull, he wants to make a decision. And if he chooses David, then all the loyalty he has to his father would would go to David. And David and Saul were, were fierce enemies. Uh, and the Bible says in James chapter 4, uh, verse 4, it says, uh, Ye adulterers and adulteresses, uh, know you not that the enmity of the, that the friendship of the world is the enemy of God? Yeah, amen. He says, The friendship of the world is the enemy of God. You see that, that thing that, that we are in that position where we got to choose. And, uh, and the first point uh, this morning or this evening, as we're looking at the Bible, is uh, right over family. And family will be a very strong thing that will pull you away from what you know you should be doing. I don't know how many times I get in church and people that I think are going to be there are not there. And I ask sometimes or somebody will come up and even volunteer them from, oh, I would have been there Sunday, but we had a thing at the barbecue with my son. Okay, I understand the family thing. I love my family. And this is going to be a little sentimental for me, so please give me a little latitude. When I got called to preach, I made a covenant with God, too, that I would serve him and that I would be faithful to him. My family took a hit because of that. When the weekends came, I have to work. They get to go play. They run off and go camping, and they ask me, Dad, come on. And I say, no, I need to be in my pulpit Sunday. There's a balance here, and you, family's important, and my son died, and now I have some regrets. I wish I would have had a little better balance going on there. I don't regret, I, I, honestly, I do not, this is a, a real life thing here. I, I don't regret what I did as far as shunning my family 
and stay in faithful and do my job and be there in the pulpit when I was supposed to be there. But there were times, come on, you can take a break once in a while, Dad. Come on, you can, come on, you got other guys that can preach for you. Come on out. There's a couple times where you can do that. Amen? Get, get a balance. But all I'm saying is there's a lot of good Christian people that have a lot to offer God, and family gets them. And he gets them instead of God getting them. Yeah. And, and the bad part about it, and I love family, don't get me wrong. Do you remember, and I know I probably said it here before, but when Jesus is in there and he's preaching to a little crowd like this. It's not a little crowd, it's full. The whole, the whole room is just packed. And uh, the, uh, his mother and his brothers come to get in. Yeah. And they can't get in because it's so crowded. And they're out there and there's a couple men out there and they said, what do you want? And they said, well, Go tell Jesus his mother and his brothers are here. And uh, so they weed through the crowd, and they go in there, and they tug on his coat and say, Jesus. And he says, yeah. He says, your mother and brother are here. And you know what he said? Yeah. He looks at them and everybody else, and he says, you go tell them. And I know he loves his mom. Yeah. You know what he said to John about her? I mean, you know he loves her. He had the perfect balance. But he said, tell them that these are my mothers and brothers. And he put the cause of Jesus Christ or the cause of his father over his family. Yeah. Family's important. Family's good. And I'm not saying, you know, no family, all God. <laughs> That'd be, that's an imbalance. God likes a just balance. So get a good balance. But give your 80% to God. Yeah. Be one of the faithful. Don't let the family rip you off. I don't, man, I know a lot of good Christians that have a lot to offer God, and the family gets them most, half the time. And to me, it's a shame, because the family, come on, there's, there's other days besides Sunday. Yeah. <laughs> Why does it always have to be Sunday? <laughs> Everybody knows I'm a Christian. Yeah. Everybody knows you, you love God and that church is on Sunday. They know that, yeah. and so does the devil, you know? Yeah. Uh, all I want to say about this one point is right over family. Family is not always right. Right is always right. Choose right over family and let God speak to your heart about, a, about the peace you can get with the balance that you need to make with your family. I wish I would have had a little better of a balance now that my boy passed away. See, I didn't see that until that happened. And now I look back and I go, now, nah, boy, my grandsons are going to get their grandpa on the camp. You know, when they go camping, grandpa's going. <laughs> and I'm not going to shirk my duties, amen? But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make sure that they get me and get that thing balanced out. But Jonathan's stuck here. And, uh, and uh, if he could put right over his father, he would have been able to make a better choice as this thing unfolds. So he's caught in the middle, and uh, uh, David becomes king, and then, then Jonathan, if David becomes king, then Jonathan is going to be an enemy if he stays with his father, and he's made a covenant with David, and it's, he's stuck. And Satan is the god of this world, and he always has hated Jesus Christ, and he always will, and, uh, and he, is, uh, he is just pushing the world against all Christianity. Uh, take your Bible and go to chapter 18, 1 Samuel 18. And we'll look at verse 10. And it came to pass on the morrow that an evil spirit from God came upon Saul, and he prophesied in the midst of the house. And David played with his hand as at other times, and there was a javelin in Saul's hand. And Saul cast the javelin, for he said, I will smite David even to the wall with it. And David avoided it out of his presence twice. And Saul was afraid of David because the Lord was with him and was departed from Saul. And uh, Jonathan has faith in David. And he trusts, he trusts David, and he knows David's a good man. Uh, look at, let's go, if you will, uh, 1 Samuel chapter 24. And you get 1 Samuel 24, look at verse 20. Twenty-four and then verse twenty. 
And now, behold, I know well that thou shalt surely be king, and that the kingdom of Israel shall be established in thine hand. And he knows it, but he's afraid. He's just afraid. Uh, my wife got a little note on her phone today. I don't know who it was from. And it said, um, uh, there's a verse that appears 365 times in the Bible. And that verse is, um, be not afraid. Wow. Says it once for every day of the year. Be not afraid. Jesus said it many times. Jesus said it when it was ridiculous to say it. Jesus said it when the waves were crashing on the boat and they were running around afraid. And he said it to them. And I'm thinking, come on, Lord. I have every right to be afraid, man. We're about to sink here, you know. But, but not with me. I mean, okay, if I'm not aboard, then you should be afraid. But I'm aboard. So what's the fear? If, if I'm aboard and I control the waves, then what are you worried about? And so then he demonstrates that fact. Be not afraid. But fear kept Jonathan from making the move he needed to make. And even when he knew in his heart that David was going to be king. And you and I both know that Jesus Christ is the right king. And we know he's going to reign. We know that. We know no matter what he says, no matter how crazy it might be, he can be trusted. Amen. It doesn't matter if it looks fearful. It doesn't matter if it looks troubling. We know that if it's his will and his way, that you can trust it. Yeah. So the first thing was right over family, but the second thing is faith over fear. Amen. And Jonathan needed to just trust. Amen. He just needed to trust. I remember one time we had a missionary, he's called Lazarus McHale, and he was, a, he was a missionary to Egypt, and our church had supported him for many, many years, and he came to our church on, uh, to come back and let us know how things were going, and he came to the church, and he said, uh, he came up to me and he says, would you like to go to Egypt and see some of the churches that the money that you guys have helped us start? And I said, yeah, I, I, yeah, I would like to see that. So long story short, I, I flew over there to Egypt, and we went there, and uh, we, looked, we, we got, into, uh, got into Egypt, and when we came into Israel, I mean I Egypt, we got off the plane, and as soon as we got off there, the guards all came up around us, America, there was three Americans, me and, me and two other preachers, and the guards all came up around us, and they were just like guarding us. And I'm going, oh, man, what's going on? Oh, by the way, it was right toward the Gulf War. Oh. So, so a Christian's not a good guy in Egypt. And an American's not a good guy in Egypt. So I, you know, I got some strikes against me here. But I'm, I'm, I'm oblivious to all these things until those guards did that. And I thought, oh, something's going on here, you know. So, so we go through Egypt and, uh, and uh, uh, the, uh, the, we get in a van and Brother Lazarus, he says, uh, we're going to go to lunch. And he says, we're taking you preachers to lunch. And we're in this VW bus and they got curtains on all the windows all the way around. And he says, now when we get up to the restaurant, we're going to open that side door, and you preachers, when we say go, you don't stand on the sidewalk and talk. Go in that restaurant, get in there, we're going to have a nice meal. When we get done, you line up by the, by the exit, and when the van pulls up and opens the door, I give you the sign, you get in that van. So by the time all this happens, I'm looking at Ricky, I said, Ricky... Are we, have we got a target on our back or something? He goes, yeah. <laughs> He's a little Alabama boy, you know. Yeah, brother, you know. <laughs> I said, okay. And so I was very afraid, yeah. Yeah. very afraid. And we'd go to church, you know, and they put us on the platform, and all them Muslims would come in, and all them Egyptians would come in, and Lazarus and Mikhail was fighting with the pastor, arguing with the pastor, and they were doing it in, in Egyptian. I didn't know what they were talking about. And I pulled him over and I said, brother, what are you talking about? And he goes, he wants to open those doors for anybody to come in here. And those, some of these people know you're Americans and know you're Christian and you're targets on that platform. And I want him to shut those doors. And he says he ain't going to shut those doors, that he opens his doors for everybody. So those doors are staying open and I don't like it. And I said, I don't either. <laughs> 
But here's what, I, here's what I'm trying to, here's what, I, here's what I needed to get. And it was a tough one. It was very tough. But I was afraid. Yeah. And I was at that platform. And I, was, <laughs> I don't know who's coming in. I don't know how they're going to come in. And I don't know what their attitude is about us being there. But I was afraid. And that went on for about 11 days. And about 11, I was there 20 days. And about the 11th day, I was on the 16th floor of this big high rise right over the Nile. Bro, it was beautiful, looking at the Nile and everything. And that was in Cairo. And uh, so I'm up there, and I'm afraid. And I was tired of being afraid. And I got on my knees, and I said, God, I'm afraid. And I'm stuck here. My flight's not going for another week and a half. I just do not like this. <laughs> you know, God don't say nothing. <laughs> but he impresses you. He impresses you. Yeah. And my impression was, son, if I wanted you dead, I'd kill you in America if I wanted you. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I don't know what you're worried about. Yeah. Just trust me. Amen. And I settled it that day. Yeah. That was in the afternoon. And I was supposed to preach that night in that same church. And I was worried about it. And uh, boy, I got it settled that night. And from then on, I walked down through Cairo like I owned the place. <laughs> but only because I just come to the real common good sense that all Christians could have. If God makes something clear to you, no matter how crazy it may sound, you just got to trust Him. Amen. When I got called to preach, it was the scariest thing that ever happened to me. And I was telling the preacher about it. I, I made a promise to God, if you do this, I'll do that. Well, he did his part, and now I got to do mine. And I did not want to do it. Just like Moses, I didn't want to do it. I'm not in his caliber, I know that. But the same kind of thing. And what, he, what he's preaching it was real life stuff. I hope you're listening. Yeah, because that's the real deal right there. Uh, but don't be afraid. Uh, take faith over fear. And Jonathan really needed to do that. He needed to address really know that, okay, if I go against dad, I know those armies by name. I know all those soldiers. If I take dad, those guys are going to come after me. That would be a fearful thing. If I stay with David, I'll be right. If I would stay with David, I don't know what I'll be under his command, but I'm sure I'll have a high place seeing him and I have made this covenant. He just needed to have faith and not fear, but that fear stopped him tremendously. In verse uh, chapter 19, if you will, and Saul spake, to, verse 1, and Saul spake to Jonathan his son and to all his servants that they should kill David. Everything in the world is going against Christianity. Now, the Bible says in verse 2, But Jonathan, Saul's son, delighted much in David. And Jonathan told David, saying, Saul, my father, seeketh to kill thee. Now, therefore, I pray thee, take heed to thyself until the morning, and abide in a secret place, and hide thyself. And I will go out and stand beside my father in the field where thou art, and I will commune with my father of thee, and what I see, that I will tell thee. And Jonathan spake good to David unto Saul his father, and said unto him, Let not the king sin against his servant, against David, because he hath not sinned against thee, and because his works have been to thee word very good. For he did put his life in his hand, and slew the Philistine, and the Lord wrought a great salvation for all Israel. Thou sawest it, and didst rejoice. Wherefore then wilt thou sin against innocent blood to slay David? without a cause he is pleading with everything he's got because if his father can just come on board he won't be in this problem anymore so he's doing everything he can but he tries with all his might and um, but the two are never going to come together they're never going to it's like saying uh, Satan come on uh, make friends with God it's not happening and this world is never going to embrace Christianity. You might as well forsake it. Amen. You might as well just get on board with this Christian thing, Amen. hide hair and all. Amen. You might as well just sell out. Yeah, I'm not asking you to make a big covenant, but it wouldn't hurt. <laughs> but just sell out because it's, this world is a losing game, brother. 
it's never gonna it's never gonna be okay for Christians and non Christians to to dwell together in unity. <laughs> Uh, John chapter 17, the Gospel of John chapter 17. Jonathan needs to get off the fence. He needs to break away. He needs to go where his heart is leading him. John chapter 17, and we'll look at verse 14. And I have given them thy word. Oh, wait just a second. Some of you are turning still. It says in verse 14, I have given them thy word. And the, word hath, and the world hath hated them, because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Are you of the world? You're not. You're not. Verse 15, I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world, but thou shouldest keep them from the evil. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world, Sanctified through thy, tr thy truth, thy word is truth. As thou hast sent me into the world, even so I have also sent them into the world. So uh, the world's never going to like us. So why are we going to serve it? Why are we going to spend most of our time with them? Why are we going to make our promises? Why are we going to invest in it when it's a losing game? It makes no sense. You got a you got a Bible believing church here, Amen. and there there are some Christians that just kind of ride that fence, and they just want to have both sides, and it's never going to work. It's never going to work. Uh, you're always going to feel convicted about siding up with the world. You're never going to have the peace until you just surrender, just surrender. It's the right thing to do. Jesus is the right cause. The search is over, brother. We have found it. Amen. We found the right king. We found the right man. We found the right book, and we found the right church. It is time to get on board. Amen. It is time. I remember when I went to San Pedro, when my wife and I went to San Pedro, uh, Chip Williams was going to start a church there. And Chip Williams was, was out of uh, Corpus Christi, Texas with Lester Roloff. And, uh, and he came out, he got called to preach, and he came out to San Pedro because he was raised in San Pedro. And San Pedro is kind of a, kind of a rough place. And, uh, and anyway, I'll make it, make it real short. Uh, Chip Williams and I got, found each other because of our kids. Our, uh, he wanted to see where my kids went to Christian school because he wanted to put, anyway, long story short, we got together over that. So he stays at my house for a couple of weeks, and the whole time he's with me, he's going over to San Pedro. I'm going to work. He's trying to get this church started. He's banging doors, knocking doors. He's all by himself. He's got nothing. God puts it on my heart to help this guy, but I'm going to another church. I'm involved in the other church. Long story short, I start praying. I say, Lord, man, this guy's all by himself. You're, I, I feel bad about it. Would you like me to help him? And I'm getting peace about that. So I go out with him, and we're knocking doors. We're knocking doors for hours. And we go and knock doors, and we're going to tell everybody in San Pedro that this new church is starting, and it's going to be two weeks from now. And two of us knock doors for, for a week, for those two weeks. When the first service started, we had 54 in attendance, and nine got saved. Wow. Pretty good start. Amen. That was 1980, August of 1980. Wow. Started with one man, and then I got with him, and that was two. Nine people got saved. Last Saturday, they went out on the street, the same church, had 13 people on the corner street preaching, had another 11 or so knocking doors, and had two go make visits to people that had come to the church. That's a lot better than two. A lot more gets done when some people sell out. A lot more gets done when some people just stop straddling the fence. Amen. I know it's a loss on your, to your fleshy side. Yeah. Your flesh is not going to like it. He's going to go kicking and screaming. Yeah. He, he's not going to like giving up whatever you got to give up. But it's worth it. It's worth it. Uh, because a lot more can get done in the sense. You know, you, you know what, brother? Uh, just, just a little something. You know, you got the scripture sign, one of these Dickman Chris, uh, scripture signs. 
and you're out there and all these cars are lining up for the red light and you're standing there with a scripture sign and nobody's coming by you, nobody's getting a track and nobody's getting saved. And there you stand and somebody's across the way and he's preaching and half the people hear him and half the people don't. But there you stand with your little sign and all these cars are going by and I mean literally hundreds, I'm sure thousands of people see Bible they have never ever seen. Some of those people never crack up. Americans don't read their Bible. Nobody cares about a Bible anymore. But here they come down the street, and there you stand with nice, big, bold print, and the Word of God, as powerful as it is, gets pierced through people's eyes that would normally never even look at it. And you don't think that's worth doing something for the Lord? I'll stand out with a dumb sign. Double-sided. <laughs> you guys are getting it, and you guys are getting it. And when the light turns green, you guys are getting it, and you guys are getting it. <laughs> Isn't that cool? Yeah. Brother, I tell you what, and you get about, you get, a, you get that corner covered, you got almost everybody seeing Bible when they never get to see it. And who knows what God will do with that? It's not our business. It's his business. Let him do whatever he wants to do. But Jonathan just needs to choose. Elijah said, uh, said about Elijah, and uh, Elijah came unto the people and said, How long halt ye between two opinions? If the Lord be God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. And the people answered him, Not a word. <laughs> Must have been Baptist. <laughs> but, but Jonathan needs to choose, does he not? He needs to just man up. As fearful as he is, he needs to just man up make the right call, and get away from his father. Yeah. Take your Bible and go to 1 Samuel chapter 20. We'll wrap this up a little bit. And verse number 1. 1 Samuel 20 and verse 1. And David fled from Naoth and Ramah and came and said before Jonathan, what have I done? What is mine iniquity? And what is my sin before thy father, that he seeketh my life? And he said unto him, God forbid thou shalt not die. Behold, my father will do nothing, either great or small, but that he will show it me. And why should my father hide this thing from me? It is not so. And David swore moreover and said, Thy father certainly knoweth that I have found grace in thine eyes. And he saith, Let not Jonathan know this, so he can hide it from you, he's saying, uh, lest he be grieved. But truly, as the Lord liveth and as thy soul liveth, there is but a step between me and death. And of course, David was right. Verse 4, then said Jonathan unto David, whithersoever thy soul desireth, I will even do it for thee. Now, Jonathan is got to make this choice. And so far, he's not made it. He's having a real rough time with it. And uh, everything that I do for my father is worthless to God because God has rejected my father. Everything I do for this world is of no value for God has rejected this world. Everything I do for David, everything I do for Christ is worth, it pays off. There's, there's two things that get eternal life. One is your soul. And the other thing is what you do for Jesus Christ. Because that is the life that you inherit. That is what goes on, is what you do for Jesus Christ. And so it's life over death. Uh, I think it was Moses one time. He got out before the people, and he told the people, and he reassured them about the commandments of God. And he said to the people as they gathered before him, he says, I set before you life and death. So what he says, the words he used, I set before you life and death. And he says, if ye will obey God's commandments and keep his words, then will the rain come in its due season. Then when your cattle multiply and flourish, then will the enemies be barred from your gates. Then will your, he just talked about a blessed life if you will just follow the Lord. And, he, and then Moses said, he was like a charge before them all. He said, but if ye will not obey the words of the Lord, then the enemies will come through and destroy your land. Then the crops, will, God will hold back the rain and your crops will dry up and then your cattle. And he just goes on and he just shows the, the uselessness of, of, of not, going with God and that's the same thing for Christianity God wants us he can use us 
But we know if, if our lives get so wrapped up in this world, we're never going to be a valiant soldier. Right. I think it was Timothy that said that. He said, if you get entangled with the world, you'll never be a good soldier. Right. And a lot of Christianity like that today. A lot of Christians just, they just get like Jonathan. They just get stuck there and they don't want to make that decision. Some, one of these days, brother, and I don't know what day it's going to be for you, but one of these days, you're just going to have to make the break. I remember one time I was sitting back there about where that preacher is on this side of the church, and I don't even remember what the preacher was preaching on, but he was on me. God was on my heart, and I was one of those Christians that just kind of hit and miss, you know. And uh, boy, I, when he got done preaching, God spoke to my heart, and he said, buddy, you need, to, you need to sign up. And I had about six kids sitting there, you know, and you get all your kids lined up, and you make them open their Bible. They ain't going to look at it, you know, but you make them open their Bible and look like they're good Christians, you know, <laughs> and half of them are falling asleep, and the other half are standing there waiting, and I say, you don't close your Bible until you see the preacher close. When you see the preacher close the Bible, you close your Bible. That's done, okay. <laughs> so I had all those kids there, you know, and when the altar taught, when the altar came, I made my decision that day. I said, today's the day. No more this off and off Christian stuff. Today, this is going to be, I am going to be, a, I'm going to live, listen to me, I'm going to live the Christian life. I'm going to do my best. I'm going to put my best foot forward to live the Christian life. This is a right life. This is a good life. Jesus Christ wants that life. He has every right to it. Uh, today, I'm signing up. And I, I got up to the altar. I got, my fam I got my wife by her hand. All the little kids come up behind us. I went up to Pastor Black. I said, Pastor Black, my name is Stephen Andrews. This is my wife, Amelia Andrews, and these are our little kids. And I says, I'm here today to say that I'm signing up to be here when these doors are open. I'm signing up to get involved with anything you might need me to get involved with. And I'm going to do my best to do it. And I'm not saying I'm becoming a perfect Christian today. I'm just saying I'm going to put my best foot forward. Amen. I'm not going to play this, this outward look as a Christian. It's going to be the genuine. I'm going to be a real, I'm going to live like one. I, I know a lot of Christians that have the name, and they are. <laughs> they are Christians. But they don't, they're not signed up. Yeah. They're just not signed up. And, and Jonathan's like that. He's, he's stuck here. And he doesn't, want to make, he doesn't want to make this final call. What would happen if he made the call? What if Jonathan said, I'm defecting. Yeah. Tonight, I'm packing my bags. I'm sneaking out in the morning. I'm going with David, and I ain't never coming back. Mm. Wonder what would have happened. So he does, he sneaks out, amen, and he gets over there and, well, I'm not going to be a prince anymore. No, I'm not going to be a prince anymore. And I'm going to be on the run. Yeah, you're going to be on the run. Uh, and I'm going to be roaming from place to place. Yeah, you're going to be roaming from place to place. But I can see David and Jonathan together, can't you? What a good team they would make. He was a good soldier himself. Very valiant soldier. You, you read about him, how he went into the Philistine camp with his armor bearer. And, uh, and uh, they, I could see Israel just flourish under the leadership of Jonathan and David. What a, what a tremendous team they would have made. No longer in tor turmoil, no longer frustrated with this decision he's got to make. He makes the break. He's feeling right about it. And he's on the right side for the first time. He's finally with a man that's the right man. He's got the right spirit. He's, he's good. And let's take our Bible and go to close here in 1 Samuel chapter 20 and verse 30. Then Saul's anger was kindled against Jonathan, and he said unto him, Thou son of the perverse, rebellious woman, do not I know that thou hast chosen the son of Jesse to thine own confusion and unto the confusion of thy mother's nakedness? Verse 31, For as long as the son of Jesse liveth upon the ground, thou shalt not be established nor thy kingdom. Wherefore, now send and fetch him unto me, for he shall surely die. And Jonathan answered Saul his father and said unto him, Wherefore shall he be slain? What hath he done? And Saul cast a javelin at him to smite him, whereby Jonathan knew that it was determined of his father to slay David. So Jonathan arose from the table in fierce anger and did eat no meat the second day of the month, for he was grieved for David because his father had done him shame. Take your Bible and go to 1 Samuel 31. Why don't you leave, Jonathan? 
You see it. It's plain as day. Why don't you leave? Please, I beg you, Jonathan, leave. Defect. Pack your bags. Get out. <laughs> he doesn't do it. 31.1. Now the Philistines fought against Israel, and the men of Israel fled before the Philistines and fell down slain in Mount Galboa. And the Philistines followed hard upon Saul and upon his sons, and the Philistines slew Jonathan and Aminadab and Mount Yeshua, Saul's sons. And the battle went sore against Saul, and the archers hit him, and he was sore wounded of the archers. And then said Saul unto his armor bearer, Draw thy sword and thrust me through therewith, lest these uncircumcised come and thrust me through and abuse me. But his armor bearer would not, for he was sore afraid. Therefore Saul took, uh, therefore Saul took a sword and fell upon it. And when his armor bearer saw that Saul was dead, he fell likewise upon his sword and died with him. So Saul died and his three sons and his armor bearer and all his men that same day together. And it didn't have to be like that. It didn't have to be that. If he'd, if he'd have just made the right call, he'd have died right. He'd have died good. He'd have died on the right side. Uh, where is he now? He's, I'm sure he's in heaven. I'm sure he's uh, bemoaning the fact that he wouldn't make the change. <laughs> Had he done it, man, it could have been such a whole different story about Jonathan. But I look at that story about him, and you know, when you read the Bible, and God has all these people in the world, and he chooses these stories to put in the Bible for you and I to read, they're there for a reason. It's not just a historical fact of what happened and what was said, and it is perfectly that. But there's a double application there. There is something there for us to look at and say, I'm learning from this guy. All of us know who the right king is. We just need to sell out. Best you can, best you can. And uh, make it easy on yourself. And say, Lord, I'm just going to point in this direction. Help me. <laughs> but boy, the sooner, the sooner you just become, live the Christian life. Most of you probably already made that decision. Might be a few of you that need to. If you do, you'd be glad you did. What, what did we look at? We looked at right over family. Faith over fear. <laughs> And I forget what the last one I would call that last one. Get my notes out. Life over death. Life over death. Everything he did for Saul come to nothing. If he'd have joined up with David, it would have mattered in eternity. Amen? Amen. Amen. All right. That's the message tonight.